Let's turn to the word, and today we find ourselves in Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 20. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out, and we know this. Before I read this, I want you to follow along with me, but not just out of duty, out of like, for in those days, the days came to pass, and a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world. Read it with fresh eyes this morning. Try and do that. The census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, every one to his own city. That means Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in their fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them totally, bam, and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, do not be afraid for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. We're going to pause there for just a moment and uh, just commit this time to God. Lord, we love you. And we thank you for what you've already been doing in our service this morning. Thank you for the hope that you've been restoring in our hearts and, and minds and in our lives today. And, and God, I pray that as we walk through your word today, that you will continue to open our eyes and ears to understanding, full understanding of what you have in store for us. God, I pray that you uh, use me this morning, use my mind, connect it with your mind. Let, let my heart be connected to yours and submitted to yours. God, I confess my sin before you, for, for your word says that if we uh, confess our sins before you, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God, I pray that at the end of the day, you'll use me, but none will be seen but you, O oh Lord. We give you these next few moments in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Now, as I read this passage, I'm reminded, even today, even as we've been talking and worshiping, I'm reminded of the nature of Almighty God. We serve a God who really, I, I call it, he's the master of the unexpected. The expectation of humanity doesn't always match up with the reality of divinity. Now, I know that's a big old statement right there, and I, I, I made it sound good, uh, but what that really means is, as human beings, our expectation, what we think God should do, isn't always what God does. Isn't that true? We, we think if, if we were God, we would do this, 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 and this, and this, and, and God often doesn't do anything that we think that God would do. The expectation of humanity does not always match up with the reality of divinity. How can a finite mind truly understand or even comprehend or even come close to the supernatural, infinite nature of God? We just walked through the book of Mark, and if you've been with us for the past year or so, you would have been a part of that journey, and it was a fantastic journey. And throughout the whole book of Mark, one example, I mean, there's examples of this all throughout the Gospels, but one example of this is when Jesus comes into the city of Jerusalem riding on a donkey. Jesus comes in to Jerusalem, which is the epicenter of the Jewish religious faith of the day, and um, he comes in riding on a donkey. The religious people of the day, they would have expected the soon coming Messiah to come charging in on a white stallion, which symbolizes victory through war, not a donkey, which symbolizes peace. They had an expectation of the Messiah when the Messiah would come. This is why the disciples were so screwed up in the beginning, because they expected the Messiah to come in war, in victory, to take out the oppressors, to rid them of the Roman rule, to get them out of there. And, and, and he comes into Jerusalem, his big announcement, he comes trotting in on a donkey. It's like the people are expecting white lightning, and they get Eeyore. <laughs> the expectation of humanity 
does not always line up with the reality of the divinity, of the divine. All throughout Jesus' ministry, we see examples like this. And so I find it fitting that the birth of Jesus follows suit, doesn't it? Think about it. All of the cosmic power of the universe and eternity stuffed into an itty-bitty living space. That stuff just doesn't happen. Well, unless you're living in Aladdin and you're a big blue genie and your home seems to be a little, you know, little bottle there. The reality is, again, that the expectation of humanity doesn't always line up with the reality of the divinity. And as we look at the story, I want you to keep that theme in the back of your mind because everything we talk about today is going to be filtered through that theme. So keep that squared away in the back of your mind. And as we look at the first thing I want you to notice here is their travel to the city of Bethlehem. Why Bethlehem? I mean, if I were God, I don't often like to play this game. Um, But every once in a while, I do play this game. And I'm like, you know, if I were God, I'd probably do things just a little bit differently here. I wouldn't, you know, if, if I was going to announce my Messiah or have him come to earth, you know, I certainly wouldn't reveal him to like shepherds. I, I, I certainly wouldn't have him in like this stable kind of environment. And I certainly wouldn't have him in Bethlehem. I, I, I would have my son Jesus be born in Jerusalem. Because Jerusalem is the epicenter of all of the Jewish religious uh, activity of the day. This would be the place that makes perfect sense to announce that the Messiah has come. So if that's the case, why choose Bethlehem over Jerusalem? You've got to have a really good reason to have the Messiah born in Bethlehem because Jerusalem, to me, seems like it would be the most perfect place. Now, if you flip over to Matthew chapter 2, because Matthew and Luke, they are the, the, the two, probably the two most often used accounts of the birth of Jesus, and some of them share details, and some of them have varying details, but together they give you a big picture of the whole birth of Jesus Christ. And if we flip over to Matthew's rendition of the story, we see the wise men show up in Jerusalem looking for this new king that had just been born. We talked about this last week. King Herod was clueless as to what was going on, and the wise men come. They're like, hey, we're looking for the king that had just been born. We saw the star. King Herod's like, what are you talking about? I'm the king of the Jews. What's going on here? He gathers the chief priests and the scribes together as Matthew 2 talks, and their answer to him was Matthew 2, 5 to 6. So they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, For thus it is written by the prophet, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, you are not least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So the most obvious first reason that Bethlehem is chosen over Jerusalem is that it is a fulfillment of prophecy. The prophecy that we read just now in Matthew is actually first read about in the book of Micah in Micah 5.2. The prophet they're referring to here is Micah. He says this, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. Something significant would come out of something not so significant. Something great would come out of something seemingly not so great. Earthly stature is not necessary in the kingdom of God. Bethlehem was interesting because if you dig deep into the history not only was what was Bethlehem, as we talked about, the fulfillment of prophecy, there's a lot of good history here. 
There's a lot of good history as to why Bethlehem would have been prophesied even in the first place. And if we take a little bit of a historical look at Bethlehem, we see that Bethlehem, whether you knew this or not, was actually the birthplace of King David. I'm not sure if you knew that or not. King David was born in uh, Bethlehem. And who was King David? Well, he was the youngest son of eight brothers born to Jesse, was her dad. And as a result of his unfortunate birth stature, you know, eight siblings, and you're the youngest, you're going to get stuck. How many youngest here do we have? Okay, in, in my family, the youngest gets special attention, says the oldest. It's not true all the time. In this situation, and growing up back then with eight you know, sons, um, David was the youngest. There was no special attention for this guy in that, you know, when it came to the siblings. And it's a similar way in my family, isn't it? And probably the same way in your family. Uh, Clara tends to call um, uh, Caleb the little prince uh, because he's like, because you can't call him a little princess, but he's like, oh, he's like a little prince. He just gets what he wants, and we always have to cater to him. He's la, 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 she keeps chirping on about Caleb being this little prince. And, and, and I, I assume that it would have been similar in this scenario. Uh, David was relegated with all the worst jobs. They all had jobs to do, and they all had responsibilities, but David was given the worst ones to do. And the very worst job that nobody wanted to do was to tend the sheep. So right on right in the inset of, of, of looking at the city of Bethlehem, we see this connection with David, who was a shepherd turned king, who grew up shepherding in Bethlehem. He knew the lands, he knew the areas, and seemingly something insignificant would turn very significant coming out of Bethlehem. Again, we look at this, and we receive this whole idea of something great coming out of something that seemingly not so great. And again, it goes back to the whole idea of our expectation not always lining up with God's reality. Now, if we continue to look at the story, we, we, we just talked about the idea of shepherds. Shepherds were also a strong focal point of the Christ birth story, weren't they? I mean, history tells us that these shepherds were tending the temple flock of sheep. The temple flock of sheep were a different breed of sheep than the regular flock of sheep. Regular flock of sheep, you look after them and you treat them. You're kind of rough and hard on them, stuff like that. But the temple flock, when you guarded the temple flock, you had to guard them. Like, like you had to be on them every minute of every day so that nothing would happen to them. Because the only way that one of these sheep or lambs could be used in a temple sacrifice is if they were without spot or blemish. And so these shepherds were guarding the temple flock in the city of Bethlehem, and these were the sheep that were reserved for the temple sacrifices that took place in Jerusalem. Why were the shepherds tending sheep destined for Jerusalem in Bethlehem? Again, we see that there's significance in Bethlehem. There's significance, there's Shepherding is, is part of its history. Uh, David was a shepherd. David was also seemingly insignificant, the youngest of the family, and turned out to be one of the greatest kings. And we see this theme starting to emerge here. One commentator says this about the city of Bethlehem. Ancient Bethlehem was surrounded by fertile fields, groves, and vineyards, benefiting from a moderate Mediterranean climate and being located at more than 2,500 feet above sea level. This is slightly higher than the highest point of Jerusalem. Average temperatures here in the summer were in the low to mid-20s, which is perfect for creating fertile soil. And the highs around 15 degrees Celsius in the wintertime. So all year long, there's a completely, it's somewhat of a moderate climate. Unlike the desert region on which it borders, Bethlehem's immediate surrounding had ample rainfall, annually running almost 20 inches. Certainly, 
Bethlehem was a place where food would have been plentiful for all. It was a great place. It was a a perfect environment for sheep. It was a perfect place to, to be a shepherd, and it was a fertile land. We get this beautiful picture of what Bethlehem would have looked like back in the day. Maybe this is why they named the city Bethlehem in the first place. Bethlehem, Beit Lechem, means house of bread. Why is this significant? Watch this. John 6, 35 says, And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me, see where I'm going, shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus, the bread of life, was born in the house of bread and laid in a feeding trough for all to see. Are you starting to see the significance of this little city of Bethlehem? That seemingly insignificant place geographically is turning out to be a significant moment, place in history, a significant place for the bread of life to be born in the house of bread laid in a feeding trough for all to come see. Coincidence? I don't think so. Not a chance. I think these are some of the many little details that we, that have been orchestrated from the very beginning of time to reveal to us the things that we expect are not always the things that God does. He reveals himself to the shepherds, the lowest of the low, the ones who are watching the sacrificial lambs to allow them to be the ones to show everyone that the final sacrificial lamb has come. The final sacrificial lamb without spot or blemish. Yet another reminder that God once took a lowly shepherd boy and exalted him to king. He's a God of the unexpected. God uses these seemingly insignificant shepherds of the day to spread the news of the birth of the Messiah. He used a supposed unacceptable situation to judge the hearts of the real followers of Yahweh, and he brought forth his son, the bread of life, in a feeding trough in the house of bread to show us unequivocally that he will supply our every single need according to his riches in heaven. And all this started, you heard me just talk about an unacceptable situation. All this kind of started when there was no room for them in the inn. The word inn there is often translated as a literal hotel motel. Um, But I won't go too far into depth on that one. You can look it up yourself. Uh, The word that is being used in here is not actually referring to that in any way, shape, or form. Uh, the, the word, there's no room, scholars are saying that when this terminology is used, there was no room for them in that place or in this area. Um, scholars are starting to say, hey, it might not be a physical room. Many scholars seem to think that the correct translation for this statement wasn't a lack of space in a physical building, but it was a lack of space and hearts. You see, we know the story. We know that Mary was visited by an angel. And we know because the Bible tells us so that she was impregnated by the Holy Spirit. And this was the immaculate conception. And it had nothing to do with Joseph. But up until that point, nobody else knew that. As Joseph went back to his roots, to his old stomping grounds, there many scholars think that he would have been rejected. For here he comes trotting in to his city with a pregnant woman who he says he is not impregnated, but they all know he's lying. Quote unquote. There, a lot of scholars think that there is great opportunity that as he entered into his hometown, that the idea that there was no room for them in the inn wasn't a physical room. It wasn't a physical space issue. It was a heart issue. 
I wonder if part of the reason that there was no room for the inn was due to the fact that many believed that the baby in her belly was an illegitimate child and they frowned against it because of that they rejected him. We know that the Pharisees, Sadducees, uh, uh, chiefs, priests, um, scribes, they all viewed Jesus as the son, as the illegitimate son of Mary and Joseph. We know that that was spread all throughout Jesus' years of ministry. So it's not a far off assumption to make that that started right here and it carried Carried with them almost every single step of the way. They rejected them because they didn't fit the mold. They rejected them, and as a result, they rejected the Messiah. What does it mean to love Christ? To love Christ means to love the unlovable, to embrace the rejected. To hold the hurting, to comfort the wounded, to befriend the sick, to speak life, not death. And if you need to speak, speak the truth in love, but always letting your actions speak louder than your words, because sometimes our words fail us. To judge not lest we be judged to humble ourselves as we exalt the king of kings. The expectation of humanity is not always the reality of the divinity. And I learned this lesson kind of the hard way yesterday. Uh, Yesterday, um, um, let me just give you a brief uh, breakdown. We used to do turkey hampers over Christmas. Um, and uh, we realized that there's another church in our, our uh, area that has been doing this for years, the past 20 years, and we started comparing lists and noticing that uh, many on our list were double-ups from the list of the other church. And so we made a decision this past year that, hey, any calls that we get for turkey hampers, we're just going to send them over to the other church that, that was doing a great job at this already, which is Paramount Alliance. And Doug Connolly, who is the, um, he's our city ward um, uh, representative, um, he was talking to me, and, and he kind of heads this up. He runs this over there, and he's like, Josh, we've got over 225 turkey hampers this year, and I, I just don't think we have enough drivers. Can, can you send some people over? And I said, you know what? Absolutely. I'm in. I'll grab my family, throw them in the van, and a bunch of you actually showed up as well, and it was fantastic. Thank you for, for spreading the love of Jesus Christ like that. And, and so... We did that, and I showed up yesterday, and we, we got our, you know, hampers, and we got our assignments, and we got our addresses, and we, you know, I grabbed my, threw my kids in the van, they were fighting, screaming, and yelling, and I'm like, I'm going to teach you what Christmas is all about. This is, this is what Christmas is all about. Get in the van. And so we get in the van, and we go and doing deliveries, and, and, you know, they're going great, because the kids are seeing that this is reality. This is not something that's cooked up in their mind. This, this is the reality. Last house we go to, I grab Calvin, and it's a bit of a beat-up house, and, and I walk up, and there's like, oh, you know, it just it gets like, oh. and I got to the front steps, and immediately the, the smell of pot was kind of, you know, just like wafting on me. I'm like, um, maybe this house doesn't need a turkey. <laughs> and I'm grabbing, I'm, I'm like, hey, Calvin, hold my hand. <laughs> Stay right close to daddy, buddy. Real close to daddy on this one. I open the door, and I, and, I, and I see this gentleman there, and he's like, and I got, got his garb up, him. And, and I'm like, hey, man, we're, we're just, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, got your turkey basket here and some food, you know, wanted just to help you out during, during Christmas. Like, oh, thanks, I was expecting that. And, and he's looking at me as, well, you know, good time you guys came and stuff like that. I'm like, oh, okay. He's like, come on in. And I'm like, oh, no, we're good. We're just, we, you know. He's like, no, 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 come on in. Come on in. And I'm like, okay, Calvin, come with me. Stay close with me, buddy. <laughs> I'm like, okay, stay real close, buddy. And he begins to take me into his house, and, and he shows me all his Christmas decorations. He's really proud of his Christmas decorations. He's done a great job decorating his house for Christmas. And, and there's this one room. It's a locked door. And he's like, oh, I want to show you this room. It's, it's locked, but I want to show it to you. I'm like, oh, no, we're good. <laughs> like, I can see it from here, brother. I can see it from here. We're good. <laughs> Calvin, get the again. Let's go. <laughs> he opens the door. Wall to wall, shrine, and there's this the picture of a kid on the wall. There's a shrine in the middle of the, of the floor 
and it's got a little, you know, urn with ashes in it. He's like, I want to introduce you to my son. My son, three years ago, at 14 years of age, he was stabbed to death in downtown Hamilton. At that moment, <laughs> at that moment, God did something to me. He's like, Josh, you're an idiot. And I'm like, yes, I receive that. <laughs> because it's true. It's true. I stood there. I couldn't wait to get out of that house. My expectation of this guy was not the reality of, of the divine. My expectation was that he was some low-life thug just trying to get a free meal. And I repented for that. And I, I repent to you today for that, for, for even thinking that, because the man's name is Blair. Because when I met Blair, he was a broken man, just lost his only son because some idiot stabbed him in an alleyway. Broken. What is it to love Christ? It means to love the unlovable, folks. It means to embrace the rejected. It means to hold the hurting, to comfort the wounded, to speak life, not death. We stood in the middle of that shrine, and I said, with, still hold my son's hand. Don't worry, I'm still. <laughs> and I'm like, can we pray for you? And he's like, I'd like that. I placed my hand on his shoulder, and I didn't even know what to, what do you pray at that? Like, what do you pray at that? And when you don't know what to pray, you just pray the peace of God. And I prayed the peace of God. And there are moments, this is going to sound weird, but there are moments where the peace of God for me can be a very tangible thing. And there are moments where it's just, I know it's there, but it's not really tangible. This was a tangible thing. I put my hand on the shoulder. This rejected man, living alone in this house, decorated for Christmas, celebrating who knows what. And all he wants for Christmas is his son back. And I stood there, put my hand on his shoulder, and I began to pray. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding it descended on us in that room. And he began to break. He began to melt. He began to cry. And we spent a few moments talking, you know, connecting and, and you know, making sure that that connection was there and all, all that good stuff. And, and as Calvin and I left, I looked at my boy. I looked at my son and what he had just experienced. And I thought to myself, I was ready to pass this house by. Because this house was seemingly insignificant. Nothing great can come out of this house. And yet, you want to know what my greatest Christmas story is? That's my great, greatest Christmas story of this year. Because I stepped into a situation, the expectation of humanity, forget that. The expectation of stature, forget that. The reality of the divinity, embrace that. Because you never know when it's going to hit you, when he's going to hit you. You never know when he's going to show up in the midst of your situation and say, hello, I'm here. You never know when you're going to be holding the, the, the hand of one of your kids and he says, hey, hey, parent, here's a ministry opportunity. Let's get after it. You never know because the seemingly insignificant are often the most significant moments. This is biblical. This is all throughout history. The shepherds, seemingly insignificant, Jesus shows up to them. The shepherd boy, David, ends up being a king. Jesus was born in a feeding trough because he's the bread of life that we all need to take a bite out of. Don't deny the seemingly insignificant. Because if you look for stature, you will fall on your face every single time. I asked my son, I'm like, son, what did you think of that? He was like, dad, he had a really big dog. <laughs> you can't always predict the outcome. <laughs> But you can walk him through it, amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we love you, Jesus. And we thank you that you use people like us. We thank you that your whole story, 
the whole story of the birth of your son Jesus Christ and, and its surroundings and even the, the, the ministry that, that you did um, all throughout the Gospels is a reminder that our ways are not your ways. Help us not to put you in a box. Help us to take you out of that box and, and place you within our hearts so that you can lead us and guide us every single step that we take. That, God, we will not look at the seemingly insignificant anymore with disdain, but you will give us fresh eyes. That, God, we will love as you've called us to love. That we will love the unlovable. That we will embrace the rejected. That we will hold the hurting. That we will comfort the wounded. We will befriend the sick and speak life, not death. God, we give you the praise. We give you the glory. We give you the honor. And we just say, come Holy Spirit. In your name we pray. Amen and amen.